This video was created for educational purpose as part of a presentation for the Cosmetics and Perfume Marketing Program at Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City. All material is for the purpose of this presentation and no monetization is relative with its content. What makes a woman interesting is that inside she is many women. To know her is to never stop discovering her. It is what makes all women beautiful. I feel the same about perfume. If it is exquisitely made, you never stop discovering it. It is constantly exciting. While much is known about Europe as the center of the perfume and cosmetic industry, the past two centuries, the American market has been giving Europe a run for their money. As we take you on this journey through time, it is important to understand how the fascinating history of cosmetics began. We'd like to take a moment to start with some ancient beauty history, as you're aware that beauty ideals have changed dramatically over the last few centuries. The word cosmetic is derived from the Greek word cosmine, which means to decorate or to adorn. When the ancient Egyptian tombs were excavated, archeologists discovered coal containers, some made of ivory, bone, and wood. Coal was a black mineral used to embellish eyelashes and eyelids. In addition to a cosmetic that was applied with a spoon or stick, coal could protect from insects that caused eye diseases, as well as shielding eyes from the hot desert sun. In ancient Greece, Rome, and China, lead carbonate was used to whiten the face, and alkanet, whose plant whose root was used for red dye, was used as cheek coloring. In the mid-1500s, cosmetic use was restricted to the boudoir, and was believed that cosmetics had magical powers. In the 1600s, eggshells were ground with water to make a face powder, and lips could be reddened by sucking on lemons. In the 1700s, women had dressing cases that included their homemade cosmetics, dyes, false hairs, and lotion. In the 1860s, it was discovered that zinc oxide made an excellent base for face powder. It was safe and inexpensive. Society believed that only actresses and prostitutes wore makeup. The thought was, the mark of a true lady was her untouched natural appearance. While our obsession with a youthful appearance began centuries ago, focusing on how the beauty industry developed into the one we recognize today begins with the companies and women who made it happen. The passageway at Perfume Passage is set in a Parisian arcade during the golden age of perfume, telling the tale of some of the most influential perfume houses of all time. Our storefront windows chronicle the changing times, but the beauty, luxury, and grandeur of our displays and collections is timeless. We started collecting men's cologne bottles and other men's toiletries. At the beginning, barbers were known for much more than cutting hair. They acted as surgeons, dentists, and religious officials as well. The famed barber pole that we still see today brings us back to a time when barbers were expected to engage in bloodletting to heal people by releasing illnesses from the body. The red, blue, and white ribbons represent blood, veins, and bandages. By the mid-1700s, barbers were no longer allowed to perform surgical procedures, but the barber pole had become an enduring symbol. Today, the barber pole embodies the skill, workmanship, and originality of today's barbers. In 1893, the first barber college opened in Chicago, followed by two more barber colleges in Iowa in 1899 and 1900. These schools offered training, education, and professionalism to the world of facial hair trimming, bringing about a new and successful industry. Around the early 1900s, barbershops began to exude a town hall kind of feel, a place for men to socialize, hear the daily news, and gossip with one another. Men's desires to look and feel good about themselves has carried on, helping to boost the industry for men's products today, which has grown to over $26 billion in 2020. In the late 1800s, apothecaries and drugstores were the place to find everything you needed for hygiene and beauty. The Mount Washington Soda Fountain and Pharmacy in Haverhill, Massachusetts opened in 1882. The pharmacy offered all the goods and services of a typical drugstore at the turn of the century. The pharmacy, which was in business until 1984, was painstakingly disassembled piece by piece. It was purchased by a gentleman in the Chicago area, where it sat in a warehouse for years. 
The entire interior of the drugstore was sold at an auction in 2013, where we acquired it. The vision for the perfume passage always included a turn-of-the-century drugstore where perfumes and vanity items were sold. Here is an interior view of the original Mount Washington drugstore, which was located 35 miles north of Boston. It shows the soda fountain counter and stools on the left, small table near the right, glass cases and counter around the store with shelves of boxed goods and cabinets behind them. The photo is dated 1936. Years ago, it was the druggist, or pharmaceutical chemist, that created the remedies to illnesses of the time. They also created soaps and creams used for hygienic and curative purposes. As time went on and the beauty industry boomed, they would start to carry soaps, powders, tonics, razors, shaving cream, makeup, and hoisery. In the 1880s, entrepreneurs began to produce their own cosmetic products that promised to provide the natural look for their customers, often selling them in the local drugstores. Some of these new companies were small, female-owned businesses. They typically used a sales agent system for distributing their products, allowing women to earn money independently. The California Perfume Company, later rebranded as Avon, successfully used this business model. While most of you have probably heard of the larger early cosmetic companies such as Helena Rubinstein, Elizabeth Arden, and Estee Lauder, there were quite a few equally successful cosmetic companies whose products were just as popular and widely used. We'd like to share with you some of the stories behind these companies and the trailblazing women, as we like to call them. Harriet Hubbard Ayer was an American cosmetics entrepreneur and journalist during the second half of the 19th century. She was a Chicago socialite. She became famous for initiating the first cosmetic company in the U.S. and for fighting to maintain her business against male competitors. She set the stage for later female cosmetic moguls. Prior to her death, she was the highest paid newspaper woman in the U.S. She wrote articles about beauty, health, and etiquette, and her essays were compiled into a popular book in 1899. Her articles influenced women around the world, and she was one of the first to have a successful career in the beauty industry. In 1886, she launched Recamier Toilet Preparations, Inc., which she managed and marketed by incorporating her own name on the label and writing strategic, innovative advertising copy. Her products included creams, balms, scents, brushes, and soaps, which brought in over $1 million a year. She used much of her earnings for interesting advertisements and paid endorsements by famous entertainers. It is Harriet Hubbard Ayer who inaugurated the beauty industry and women's acceptance of cosmetic products that would change grooming habits forever. She anticipated modern American consumer culture and identified women as consumers for whom shopping became a leisure activity and makeup a necessity. By the end of the 1920s, the Harriet Hubbard Ayer's products included perfumes, toilet waters, talcum powders, hair shampoos and tonics, soaps, bath salts, and manicure implements. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission listed Harriet Hubbard Ayer as the third largest manufacturer of cosmetics in the United States by the late 1920s. Some early promotions and advertisements for her products included Wrinkle Eradicator, a product that assisted in eradicating wrinkles, of course, skin whitener, particularly to be used in the evenings, creating an alabaster effect, Ayer Aristocrat Vanishing Cream, relieves skin irritations, tan, sunburn, chap lips, and will positively not grow hair. Annie Turnbow Malone was born to former slaves in Metropolis, Illinois. Some historical accounts say that she dropped out of high school due to illness, and others say it was to practice hairdressing. But by all accounts, she had a good knowledge of chemistry, and by the age of 20, had developed her own shampoos and scalp treatments to grow and straighten hair. She took to the streets to demonstrate and sell her wares. By 1902, her products were a success. Malone named her company Poro Products and moved to St. Louis to expand the business. You might have watched the 2020 Netflix four-part series called Self Made, inspired by the life of Madame C.J. Walker starring actress Octavia Spencer. It was the story of Sarah Breedlove, who developed and promoted a line of beauty and hair care products for black women through her Madame C.J. Walker manufacturing company in the early 1900s. She marketed herself as an independent hairdresser and retailer of cosmetic creams. Madame C.J. Walker was born to former slaves in Louisiana as their first child born into freedom. In her 30s, she suffered from hair loss and began experimenting with different hair treatments and products. For a time, Walker worked for Poro Products as a sales representative and learned the business. 
In 1905, she invented a method for straightening black women's hair and a formula for hair growth, which she said was given to her in a dream. She moved to Denver, Colorado, where she married Charles Walker and opened her own business, selling her hair restorer through door-to-door -door sales. In 1908, she opened a second office in Pittsburgh, as well as opening Layla College with her daughter Layla to train hair culturalists. In 1910, she opened the company's national headquarters in Indianapolis for manufacturing and training of the Walker agents. Madame C.J. Walker preparations, which included facial treatment powders and other cosmetic treatments created for and marketed to African-American women, made Madame C.J. Walker one of the nation's first women millionaires. Sarah Spencer was born in 1889 in Beckley, Virginia. She moved to Atlantic City and worked as a hairdresser. In 1913, she started a hairdressing business in a small one-room beauty shop experimenting with ingredients and was granted a patent for a new system of straightening the hair of black women. In 1919, she founded Apex News and Hair Company. She worked in the beauty salon during the day and also taught students the trade. In the evenings, she sold her cosmetics throughout the city. By the mid-1930s, the Apex Beauty and Products Company was the largest New Jersey black-owned business and one of the nation's leading black manufacturing companies. In addition to the cosmetics company, she owned Apex Publishing Company, which published Apex News for beauticians and sales agents, Apex Laboratories, Apex Drug Company, and Apex Beauty College. There were 11 beauty schools in the U.S. and franchised schools overseas. Apex Beauty Systems made Sarah one of the first African-American millionaires. She was awarded a medallion at the New York 1939 World's Fair as one of the most distinguished businesswomen in the country. Nobia Franklin expanded a 1915 beauty salon into a chain of salons and eventually created one of the first major line of cosmetics to include face powders that were meant to flatter rather than lighten darker skin tones. By 1917, she opened the Franklin School of Beauty Culture and relocated manufacturing, salon, and educational operations to Houston. In 1922, she moved to Chicago to open a salon and school and expand on the manufacturing of her business. She began to teach others the Franklin way of styling hair using her products. Like Malone and Walker, she trained women to style and grow hair using her products and encouraged them to set up shops to style, straighten hair, and sell the company's skin and hair products. The company's wide range of products included hair tonics, hair growers, soaps, pressing oil, and face powder created for an African-American clientele. Franklin didn't quite reach the success of Annie Turnbow Malone, Madame Walker, or Sarah Spencer, in part because she wasn't able to build as large a network of sales agents, nor did she acquire patents for her creations. Dorothy Gray was born Dorothy Cloudman in Gorham, Maine, where she grew up on a farm. After moving to New York, she worked for Elizabeth Arden as a treatment girl before opening her own salon in New York in 1916. Until Revlon Inc. appeared on the scene, Dorothy Gray was one of the three most successful cosmetic companies in the U.S., the others being Helena Rubinstein and Elizabeth Arden, both of whom, like Dorothy Gray, had strong personalities. In the early years, Dorothy Gray's attention focused on mature female clients who had the time and money to devote to the skincare treatments and cosmetics that were available in her salons. So, reducing the signs of aging was high on her agenda. Her treatments included facial rejuvenation procedures, skin stimulations, and liquefying cleansing routines. One of her most popular products in the 1920s was a face patter. It came complete with instructions on how to slap or pat your face with a rubber disc to bring color to your cheeks. I'm sure it brought about quite a few bruises too. In the 1940s and 50s, Dorothy Gray also made ladies powder compacts, the mask design being one of her most recognized vanity items. Hazel Bishop was an American chemist and the founder of the cosmetics company Hazel Bishop Inc. She was the inventor of the first long-lasting lipstick. From 1935 to 1942, she worked as a research assistant in a dermatological laboratory at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She was then inspired by her mother's advice to open your own business, even if it's only a peanut stand. She began to conduct experiments on her own time, experimenting with dyes, oils, and molten wax. Her goal was to produce a non-drying, smudge-proof, long-lasting lipstick that would not smear on clothing or cups. In 1948, along with Alfred Berg, 
she founded Hazel Bishop Inc. to manufacture these no-smear lipsticks. The lipstick debuted at the Barnard College Club of New York in 1949. In 1950, the brand was unveiled at Lord & Taylor, where the lipstick tubes sold for $1 each. The lipsticks proved to be a success, selling out on its first day of launch. Her products ended up taking over 25% of the American lipstick market, and in four years, sales soared to $10 million. In 1951, Bishop became the first woman to appear solo on the cover of Business Week. Her company also made powder compacts. Ruth Maurer is not a familiar name in the cosmetics industry, and it might be a surprise to many to learn that at one time her company made millions of dollars, had outlets that sold their cosmetics throughout the US, and for a time, her brand was better known than Helena Rubinstein or Elizabeth Arden. A contributing factor was probably that Maurer did not use her own name to name her company, at least not in the beginning. In addition, she developed a persona of a beauty specialist named Emily Lloyd, and it was under this name that she offered beauty advice in its syndicated newspaper columns as well as in beauty-related pamphlets and textbooks. According to the American Perfumer and Essential Oil Review, she made her first batch of creams in a double boiler in the basement of her La Crosse, Wisconsin home around 1901. It was reported that her husband gave her $300 and said that he was prepared to lose it all in his wife's little venture. She wasn't a chemist, but as the wife of a doctor, she had access to a range of reference and raw materials. Maurer's idea was to establish Marinello shops in areas where her products could be sold, but also where women could receive personal beauty treatment and service and advice. She established the Marinello schools where women were taught how to care for all aspects of their personal care. Maurer trademarked the name Marinello as a brand for training and education in the beauty culture field, and the Marinello Way was born, along with the National School of Cosmeticians. If there were doubts about women wanting to use cosmetics in the early 1900s, then the phenomenal growth of the Marinello Company dispelled them. Marinello Company was founded in 1905, and by 1912, there were nearly 70 Marinello outlets or agents throughout the US. While the company had offices in major cities like New York, Chicago, and Boston, they also focused on smaller cities, where they were able to offer women beauty treatments and cosmetics which were not readily available. She often used the image of an elephant on her products. While it's important to recognize some of the early cosmetic companies that we are not as familiar with, it is also important to acknowledge the early companies that do have the name recognition. Max Factor, who opened his salon in Los Angeles in 1909, was making a name for himself with his work in Hollywood. He helped create the on-screen looks of many female actresses, including Theta Barra's heavily cold eyes. Florence Nightingale Graham, known as Elizabeth Arden, was a Canadian-American businesswoman who founded and built a cosmetics empire that began in 1910. By 1929, she owned approximately 150 salons in Europe and the US, and her nearly 1,000 products were sold in 22 countries. Arden taught women how to apply makeup, provide beauty makeovers, and introduced the concept of coordinating colors of eye, lip, and facial products. She promoted makeup as proper and appropriate, even necessary for a lady-like image, and that it wasn't only for actresses and prostitutes. She also targeted middle-aged and plain women, promising a youthful, beautiful image if they used her products. Helena Rubinstein immigrated to Australia, where she set up a cosmetics and beauty salon business in 1904 that would soon become a global enterprise. Brandishing the slogan, Beauty is Power, she succeeded as few others had in the male-dominated business world of the early 20th century, especially as a Jewish woman from Central Europe, establishing herself in the world's fashion capitals. She also happened to have very good taste in art, and her adventurous spirit gravitated to the avant-garde. At the outbreak of World War I, Helena Rubinstein moved to New York from Paris, where she opened a cosmetics salon in 1915. A cosmetics entrepreneur, she was the founder of Helena Rubinstein Inc., and became one of the world's wealthiest women. 
Her company effectively marketed and provided luxurious packaging for her products. She was aware of the value of using celebrity endorsements, overpricing products, and promoting the pseudoscience of skincare. The Day of Beauty in her various salons became a great success. A window in the passageway is devoted to both of these cosmetic moguls with a wide variety of their perfumes and cosmetics on display. The first cake mascara from Maybelline was launched in 1917. The brand name was inspired by the sister of founder Tom Lyle Williams. He watched his sister Mabel concoct her own eye and lash makeup from Vaseline and Ash. He perfected a cake mascara, or mascaro as it was known then, made from sodium stearate, a common vegetable-based soap material sourced from coconut and palm oils. a traveling book salesman. Formerly called the California Perfume Company, Avon was founded in 1886 by David H. McDonald. He would give samples of perfumes while doing door-to-door -door book sales and started to realize his female customers were far more interested in the free perfume samples than his books. He also realized that women were isolated at home while their husbands were working. This was the start of his concept for recruiting female representatives to sell what was becoming his popular perfumes. At a time where women had limited employment opportunities, Avon was a revolutionary concept which marked the beginning of the company's long history of empowering women around the globe. Estee Lauder was born Josephine Benzer and raised in Queens, New York. She was a visionary and role model who once said, I never dreamed about success, I worked for it. You don't get there by wishing for it, hoping for it, or dreaming about it. You get there by working for it. Esty got her start selling skincare and makeup in beauty salons, demonstrating her products on women while they were sitting under hair dryers. Along with her husband Joseph, she officially launched her company in 1946, and a year later they got their first major order, $800 worth of products from Saks Fifth Avenue. She had instincts for what women wanted, and was the complete saleswoman and marketer. She believed that to make a sale, you had to touch the customer show her the results on her face, and explain the products. That was the start of the company's personal high-touch service. She took the gift with purchase idea to new heights, elevating it so that it became standard industry practice. And we all know how much we love those freebies. Her perfumes, powder compacts, and solid perfumes are quite collectible and are on display throughout Perfume Passage. The New York William Colgate Company, formed in the early 1800s, was one of the first cosmetic and perfume companies in the U.S. and was run by his son Samuel after his death in 1857. He introduced perfumed soaps and perfume essences in 1866. In 1872, Casimir Bouquet was the first milled perfumed soap and was registered as a Colgate trademark. They sold their first toothpaste in 1896, and then won top honors for soaps and perfumes at the Paris World's Fair in 1900. They were one of the largest perfume houses in the U.S., offering 65 fragrances in 1910. They were purchased by Palmolive in 1928. Another early toiletry company was Gillette, yes. That same Gillette company. King Camp Gillette founded the company in 1901, and two years later started manufacturing disposable blades. The rest, as they say, is history. The Richard Hutnett Company once maintained separate U.S. and European headquarters in New York and Paris. In 1880, he registered his name as a trademark in both France and the U.S. He was recognized as the first American to achieve international success in cosmetics manufacturing. His was a household name in the early 1900s. Women were attracted to the company's products as they could order perfumes and soaps on approval, paying with postage stamps or money orders. If they weren't satisfied with the items, they received a refund. By the early 1900s, his company built up his product line and he produced perfumes, colognes, toilet waters, sachets, tooth products, soaps, skin creams, and other cosmetics. A passageway window shows a large variety of Hudnut perfumes, makeups, and compacts. By the late 1920s, four main product lines included Dewberry, Three Flowers, 
Gemi, Marvelous, and a very successful line of hair care products. His beauty products were sold in department stores throughout the US. Hudnut wanted to give his cosmetics and perfumes a high-end feel, and so he did not do a lot of product advertising. Instead, he distributed booklets to clients that detailed all his products and how to use them. In addition, he did not want to cheapen his products by offering discounts, so he required a strict policy that retailers who sold his products could not offer discounts on them. One of Hudnut's most popular items were his Three Flowers line that was introduced in 1915. Toiletries included perfume, cologne, dusting and face powders, lipsticks, and a variety of face creams. Products were sold individually and in vanity and travel sets. At the height of the Great Depression, the Schulten Company, created by William Lightfoot Schultz in 1934, was engaged in soap manufacturing. The first Old Spice product, called Early American Old Spice for Women, was launched in 1937, and the following year was followed by Old Spice for Men. In 1938, the company had had a very successful year, in which the annual sales grew ten times in one year and tripled the following year. It's been said that Schultz was inspired by his mother's rose jar when creating the early version of Old Spice. A rose jar usually held a moist potpourri of rose petals, spices, and herbs in a base of salt to preserve them. We have a Schulten exhibit with many Old Spice products on display in the main area of the museum. And not to date ourselves, but we remember buying their soap on a rope products for our fathers in the 1960s and 70s. There are hundreds of cosmetic companies worth mentioning, but only limited to an hour. But I think you get the idea that each decade throughout the 1900s, fashions, social norms, fads, and Hollywood dictated the changes and growth to the cosmetic industry. In order to remain competitive and achieve larger distribution of their products, cosmetic businesses began to wholesale their products through chain pharmacies and department stores. We do want to mention one of the most measurable changes that happened to the beauty industry that might not have occurred to you. In the 1940s, when millions of women entered the workforce during World War II, the money spent on beauty products increased dramatically. Bold rouge, powder, lipstick, and nail polish were popular among younger women. Working women cut their hair shorter, sporting a more manly look, and makeup was used to assert their femininity. When nylon stockings became unavailable due to wartime shortages, women turned to leg makeup, painting on their hoisery to give them the illusion of wearing real nylons. Advertisements and armed forces recruiting campaigns emphasized that a women's responsibility was to support the war effort and maintain their feminine identity through their makeup. And that's where we are today. It's an entirely other presentation to discuss the beauty industry complex after World War II. And we're not prepared to establish a museum for those products. Perhaps an addition or an annex? Eh, who knows. We want to leave you with a few interesting facts from loudcloudhealth.com.